this video we'll be continuing our MCU based hardware design in Altium Designer. Previously we chose the switching regulator and looked at how to size switching regulator components. In this video we'll see how to then root them up in Altium Designer on a schematic and also how to add power ports and finally how to implement a very basic version of USB-C with a USB-C connector looking at communication channels and so on. I'd highly suggest following along and to help you do so, please check out the link in the description below to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. Let's get started. Now we've pretty much placed all components for this buck converter section. Of course, now we have to hook this up with wires. The way we do that in Altium Designer is press Control W as a shortcut and we can start clicking, for example, the switch node, linking it up to this inductor. When we're done, we can right click. So I would strongly suggest you try this out for yourself and follow along. I'll route this up and we'll see each other in just a second. So I've hooked things up, at least a few things up like so, just using the control W wire command. So my switch node goes out into my inductor and to my output capacitor at my output, I step down this voltage and feed it back to my feedback pin. On the input side of things, I simply connect my input capacitor to my VIN pin. I've also tied the run pin purely to my input voltage, VIN, to make sure as soon as the input voltage is applied over a certain threshold, this device turns on. Now you see, it doesn't look quite right, does it? We're missing a few things. We're missing power nodes and we're missing ground connections. The way you do that in Altium Designer, if you look at the top toolbar, we can place various ports. So we can right click and that opens up this drop down menu. We need ground ports and we need power ports. Let's place ground first. So click on ground and this ground icon appears. We can place it at sections we need it. Like so right click to cancel and then control W to root up. There we go, that looks a tiny bit better. We've hooked up all our ground connections. But now we're missing our input voltage and output voltage flags. We do the same thing, we go to the top toolbar, right click and place ports. It doesn't really matter what port you select, we can change them later on. I'm just gonna select this five volt port here. Before I place, I can press tab on my keyboard and on the right side you can see this has now brought up this properties panel. I'm gonna type in plus five V, V indicating volts of course, and then click this icon and this resumes. So I can place it and I can place another port on the right here. Again, tab, I can change the name to plus 3.3 volts. Like so, click, right click to cancel and control W to root these up. There we go. Now we have our input voltage, which is nominally five volts and we'll see how to root that up to the USB connector. We have our 3.3 volts of the output, but we're still missing this mode connection and this mode connection, I will simply tie to ground as well. And this puts the switching regulator in a certain mode. For us, this isn't important at the moment. This is just following the recommended application diagram. So now we've labeled our main power nets, we've added ground, and we've pretty much hooked up this buck converter as we would probably want it to. However, there's something I always like to do with my schematic, and that is label all nets. And we'll see when we come to PCB layout and routing how important that actually is. Right now, if I, for example, zoom into this switch node net here and just click on it, you can see the net name is net L question mark underscore one. Of course, when we annotate the schematic and give this question mark, for example, a one, so L1, this will change to net L1 underscore one. However, this isn't particularly useful. It doesn't tell the PCB designer what kind of net type this is. Therefore, we want to add net labels. So press P on your keyboard and then press N or click on this net label. And this lets me place names or name my nets. I can press tab to give this a net name. I'll just type in buck underscore SW or buck switch node. And then I'll place that somewhere on this wire and right click to cancel. If I click on this net again, the net name is now buck underscore switch. This gives the PCB designer a lot of info how this net should be routed. And we'll see that when we come to PCB design. I don't like this overlapping text, so I'm gonna make this a bit smaller. So I'm gonna click on this, change my font and make it significantly smaller. So let me label all of these other nets and make sure to do that on your schematic as well. For us, we simply have this buck V feedback. And we're pretty much done with this buck converter schematic. But we also have to think about where does this power even come from? Where does this five volts come from? So we need to add the USB connector. I won't be going into too much detail into USB-C in this video, and we'll just look at the basics, how we can sync a certain amount of current very easily using a USB-C connector. However, there's so much more to USB-C that I strongly encourage you to have a bit more of a look around. As an introduction, I can highly recommend Microchip's application note 1953, which goes through the USB connector. For example, showing you the various USB form factors and how that relates to USB-C and how USB-C is different. 
Also tells you about USB upstream and downstream phasing ports. So if there are host ports or device ports, which ones sync or source current. If you're unfamiliar with USB-C receptacles and their symmetry, you should check out page three to look at standard USB-C receptacles and how the plug is slightly different. A description of the various pins, including the sideband use pins, you can see also in these tables quite nicely. Also recommended power ratings and signal speeds. What will be important for us for syncing a certain amount of current without a specific negotiation, at least through an IC, are the CC pins. And we'll see how to negotiate essentially a certain amount of current from the host with two simple resistors. And if you check out page 10 on this application note, you can have that explained in more detail. Now we should add the USB-C connector to our design because this is our main source of power entry. The connector we chose was the USB 4105 from GCT. Now if we look at the data sheet, we can see all of the information we need to create a footprint for this design. So I'd strongly suggest you create your own footprint for this. You can then compare that to the footprint I linked in my libraries, which I'll be using for my design. So make sure to pause the video and give this a try for yourself, even though this footprint might look a bit more complicated than others, but it's good practice to do so. Keep in mind that we also have the pinout on the right side to create the schematic symbol. In Alton Designer, I've already created this schematic symbol and it's also included in the libraries I showed you in my GitHub profile. So I'm gonna search for USB, and then pick out my 4105GF, right click, place, and I'll place it to the left of this buck converter. Remember, we want to have our flow from left to right, input, output. So I can move things around just to clean up the schematic a tiny bit, and we have various USB-C pins. Let me just explain them in brief detail. USB-C connectors come in various flavors, so they might just be power only, they could be USB 2, USB 3, and so on. What we always have are VBUS pins, so these are the main power pins, normally 5 volts with respect to ground. Then we have the ground pins on the bottom, we have some sort of shield, and we have the CC pins as standard. The CC pins are the communication channel pins and are used for USB-C power delivery. If we simply want to make a device, or a USB-C device, which we can get up to about 1.5 amps of current with, we have to tie each of these CC lines down to ground with a 5.1 kilo ohm resistor on each individual line of CC. This is the simplest way of extracting power, so to speak, from a USB-C host. We also have these SPUs, which are sideband use signals, and we won't be using those. And we have these differential pair signals. So DN, which is the inverted differential pair signal, and DP, which is the non-inverted differential pair signal. We can also always see that we have essentially pairs of these connections. This is because USB-C, of course, you can plug in two different ways. So depending on if the orientation is one, then we'll have all the top pins connected. And if the orientation is flipped by 180 degrees, we have the bottom pins connected. In more formal designs, we would use USB switches to ensure we don't have any stubs when routing. But for us, we'll just link it together to make sure we'll always have a connection, regardless of the orientation of the USB-C connector. Let me just hook up and connect this USB-C connector, and we'll discuss the circuitry after I've done that. And I'll see you in just a second. So now I've hooked up the USB-C connector, and it might seem overwhelming if you haven't seen something like this before, but let's go through it in detail and section by section. Keep in mind, this is a very simple educational device, so I haven't included ESD protection or taken much care with filtering and something you should definitely do for commercial level designs. To start, I've hooked up ground to ground, and I've connected the CC1 and CC2 pins, both with a 5.1 kilo ohm resistor to ground, and I've labeled the nets as you should do. Tying these to ground enables the device to sync current. SBU1 and SBU2 I've left floating because they're unused, and the shield I've also left floating. For the case of a device, and because we don't have a proper metallic enclosure for this, in my opinion it's best to leave this floating, but there are many differing opinions, and it's entirely situation and scenario dependent. Before moving on to the differential pair, we have VBUS, which again I've labeled with one of these power ports, and I've called it plus VUSB. This is where our 5 volts is derived from. I say derived because we feed VUSB through what is called a Pi filter, and that then essentially generates our 5 volts, so to speak. It's effectively a low pass filter in the form of a capacitor, carried bead, and a capacitor. This is a bi directional filter, so any noise generated by our circuitry on the power line will be attenuated when going back through the cable. This is a very crude and basic filter, and especially when you're choosing ferrite beads, you have to be very careful not to induce resonances and make sure the value is chosen appropriately. However, it's a good idea to always include filtering on power lines, and especially when exiting or entering a board with cables. But you can essentially think of this as a bi-directional low-pass filter. 
If you haven't been exposed to ferrite beads before, they are similar to inductors and similar to resistors in the fact that they behave resistively over a certain frequency range, so the energy is dissipated as heat. They're useful for building filters and for power line filtering and so forth, but they are quite difficult to design for. So to get more information on ferrite beads, I strongly recommend the analog devices app note AN1368 going through what ferrite beads are, how you can use them, for example, in power supply filtering, their impedance or ferrite bead response characteristics, and how you might use them in filtering designs at the same time of trying to mitigate LC resonances and so forth. I also haven't added any ESD protection to this device, and this is something you definitely should do, again, for commercial level designs. As we talked about earlier, because this is a USB-C connector, we have two ways of plugging in this USB-C cable. So we have to tie our DNs together and our DPs together. Now for USB fall speed, which is fairly slow, we have fairly slow rise and fall times, so fairly slow clock speeds, this is okay to do. However, for high speed or super speed even, this is something you shouldn't do, and you should always use a dedicated USB switch, but we won't go into detail in this series of videos. Again, I've labeled my nets, and especially underscore N and underscore P lets Altium Designer know this is a differential pair, in addition to these symbols. These red symbols here are differential pair directives. We can place them by pressing P and then V or going to directives and then differential pair. Now we place these on lines that end with underscore N and underscore P to tell Altium Designer this is a differential pair. This is very important when it comes to routing because we have to route differential pairs a certain way. If I click on one of these directives, we can look at the parameters I've also added by clicking add differential pair net class. And this is incredibly important when you have different types or signaling types for differential pairs. You could have USB, you could have MIPI, CSI, HDMI, and in those designs, it's important to distinguish between them. We can distinguish between them, for example, using a differential pair class name. We've already encountered net names or net labels, as we've seen here, but we haven't encountered these two yellow blocks before. And these are global ports, and these enable us to connect between schematics. And we'll see this later again when we fill in our overview schematic page. We can place them by pressing P, port, and then giving them the same name as the net label itself. And this makes sure we have interconnectivity between sheets when we're creating a hierarchical overview sheet. I know this is probably a lot to take in in one video, but please make sure to check the data sheets and run through this video as many times as you need to make sure you understand before you move on to the next part of the series. We talked about the buck converter, creating the component symbol, linking it with the footprint. We talked about sizing, inductors, capacitances, and the feedback network, connecting up with wires, remember the control W command, and also adding ports using this top place port command here. Then we looked at the USB-C connection. I remember the CC line CDP port low to give us our basic device sync capabilities and all of these other various connections. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and you learned a few things of how to use Altium Designer as well as how to implement a very basic USB-C connection. In the next video, we'll finally get to adding our microcontroller to the schematic, doing a pinout and more. So make sure to stay tuned and subscribe to Altium Academy so you don't miss out on the next videos. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.